Good morning. Please turn me with, with me in your Bibles to Psalm 130. If you're using the Black Bible in front of you, it's on page 518. Today, we're continuing our Summer in the Psalm series. It's been refreshing to see how the Psalms, through the God-inspired writings of Israelites over the course of at least five centuries, have revealed more of God's glory to us. I pray that this summer series has caused us to evermore be in wonder, awe, fear, and reverence of God, and to draw us closer to the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ in our lives. Today, I share with you what I discovered in my study of Psalm 130, and I pray that this time together will help us to see and identify with the psalmist in his journey from his depths to the heights of God's grace. Psalm 130, 1 through 8. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege to gather with our brothers and sisters in worship of you, O holy, perfect, righteous, and just God. Help us to have attentive ears to what your word speaks to us this day. We ask that by your Holy Spirit, the words of the psalmist to whom you inspired would resonate with us in a way that would humble us, encourage us, and strengthen us, that we might live in a way that gives glory to your name and points each other and the world to you. In Jesus' name, amen. When we think of the word depths, or about being in the depths, what might we think of? We may think of mental health, depression, isolation, other battles of the mind. We may think of physical health, loss of mobility, a bad diagnosis, or some of those that are in constant pain. We may think of financial difficulty, Dips in the market, bankruptcy, loss of value or property. We may think of being unemployed or underemployed. We may think of the Afghan people and other examples of people wanting to escape their own countries. We may think about experiencing the loss of loved ones. And even greater than that, for us believers, losing those that we love that are apart from Christ. Gloria just recently turned seven months old and she's been pretty mobile for a few weeks. She's still learning how to go from sitting up to laying down without falling over and bonking her head. I started to think about what Gloria's depths might be. I think it may be this, being put in her crib for nap or bedtime, and she's crawling around her crib. She doesn't quite know how to back up, so her face is pressed against the crib walls. She somehow gets her foot stuck between the crib rails, and she starts to cry for the great peril that she's experiencing as she fumbles around in the dark, not knowing how to be freed. Andrea and I hear her, and we rescue the distressed babe. Her tears, although still running down her chubby cheeks, are taken over by her grin of relief and happiness. Her trouble has been resolved. And we believe, and understandably so, that if our difficulties and trials are resolved, that we would somehow be lifted from our depths. We rejoice, we become happy, thankful, and we may give God glory for allowing our circumstances to change for the better. Similar to the way Gloria feels when we're lifting her out of her depths, the depths of her crib cage. These are very real and good examples of what it may mean to be in the depths, but I'd like to draw our attention to what the psalmist of Psalm 130 means by the depths and the rescue and hope the Lord brings to those he chooses to rescue. The main idea for this morning, wait on and place your hope in the Lord who redeems his people of their sin. 
There's three key observations. Number one, the depths of sin and the Lord who forgives, verses one through four. Second one, waiting on the Lord and hoping in his word, verses five and six. And for the third point, the salvation of the Lord, verses seven and eight. Let's look at verses one and two. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. When we think about the depths, I'd like to draw your attention to how they are spoken about in the Bible. These biblical references give some clue to the weight of the idea of being in the depths. In Psalm 62, verses 1 through 2, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the deep mire where there's no foothold. I've come into the deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. The psalmist in Psalm 69, attributed to David, speaks of the deep mire, the deep waters, and the flood that sweeps over him. In Lamentations chapter 3, verses 55 through 60, I call on your name, O Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ear to my cry for help. You came near when I called on you. You said, do not fear. You have taken up my cause, O Lord. You have redeemed my life. You have seen the wrong done to me, O Lord. Judge my cause. You have seen all their vengeance, all their plots against me. In Lamentations, we get the picture of being in deep distress in the midst of trouble from those who would cause harm, those who seek vengeance against the writer, taunting, plotting, seeking to assail and destroy. Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. In these examples, the writers are crying out. These aren't timid cries for help. These are loud cries and pleas for mercy and for rescue. Verse 2 from our text. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. These examples give insight to physical threat, imminent danger, plots, schemes to destroy. I have a hard time connecting with this type of peril, the peril of people wanting to destroy me. Maybe some of you have experienced this. Maybe some of you know what this looks like. The closest thing that I can think of are neighborhood fights that I get into as a child. Mom, help! Many times I would look up and see my mom running to my rescue to save me from a bully who was seeking to pummel me or had already. God bless her. Looking to the text of Psalm 130, I don't think a bully is what the psalmist is referring to. We get a clear picture of what the psalmist is needing mercy from in verse 3. Verse 3, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? The rhetorical question, who could stand? Who could stand? In Jeremiah 16, 17, Jeremiah declares God's word to Israel. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from me, nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. In Psalm chapter 90, verse 8, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. The psalmist in 130 is talking about his sin. God knows his sin. He knows his iniquities. The psalmist is feeling the weight, the guilt, and the depth of his sin. He understands that he has no excuse no good reason, no one to blame. And he cries out to the God who sees his sin. Holy, holy, 
perfectly just, righteous, immutable, omnipresent, omniscient God. Church, when was the last time that we thought of, pondered, and cried out to God in light of our iniquity, of our sin, and in light of what God's word teaches us of him? Likely at the time of conversion. But do we exercise the privilege and ongoing practice of repentance and turning to God? This posture and positioning before the holy God and judge of all things is a serious matter. Who could stand? Who can stand? The rhetorical question again, who could stand, gives a glimpse of the beginning of hope that the psalmist believes in. Verse 4, but with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Hallelujah! If we truly understand the depths of our sin, our iniquity before the holy God, how can we not give praise to him who marks iniquity and yet forgives us? Hallelujah! That you may be feared. Fear. Reverence. Awe. I remember watching footage of a very big tornado in Arkansas a few years ago. The person videoing it on their phone is seen trembling and saying, oh my God, oh my God. A terrifying fear of God's creation on display. We went to Lake Michigan recently and saw the waves roll in and out. It gave us feelings of fear and awe. Lake Michigan, way smaller than the ocean, but bigger than any body of water here in Indiana. We fear and are in awe of many things. We fear and give awe to things that are temporal, things we can touch, feel, see, news that we read, things we watch. It's not wrong in itself for us to feel and experience fear, but do we turn to God when we fear? Oh, that we would fear and be in awe of the Lord, that we would give our full reverence to God, that by the Holy Spirit we would turn to God when we experience fear and smash and tear down subtle idols of fear and anxiety that we build in our pride and self-centeredness, that we may not be sinfully fearful and anxious, but that we would fear the Lord only. In Isaiah chapter 8, verses 11 through 13, it says, For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me, and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Consider what the Puritan John Flavel wrote in his introduction of Triumphing Over Sinful Fear in reference to Isaiah 8, 11 through 13. There is not more diversity found in the outward features than in the inward tempers and dispositions of men. Some are as timorous as hares and start at every sound or yelp of a dog, others as bold as lions and can face dangers without trembling. Some fear more than they ought and some before they ought and others when they ought not at all. The carnal person fears man, not God. The strong Christian fears God, not man. The weak Christian fears man too much and God too little. There is a fear which is the effect of sin springing from guilt and hurrying the soul into more guilt. And there's a fear which is the effect of grace springing from our love to God and his interest in driving the soul to God in the way of duty. The less fear any man hath, the more happiness, except it be of that fear which is our happiness and our excellency. End quote. Happiness and excellency, we're talking about the fear of God. We need help to be Christians who fear God, the God who gives mercy and grace and forgiveness despite the depths of our sin. We must be reminded of the depths of our sin and to fear the God who forgives us. These truths should lead us to a posture of humility, repentance, and dependence on him. We should joyously Fear him. In light of these truths, let us consider where the psalmist takes us next in verses 5 through 6 concerning his waiting on the Lord and his hoping in the Lord's word. 
Let's look at verse 5 and 6. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. Church, what have we been waiting for? What have we been placing our hope in? Relief from distress? Employment, better employment, promotion, to be married, to have children, to send children off, retirement, traveling, home renovation, selling, buying, inheritance, those 2021 Jordans, new video games, cell phone and technology, protection, safety, for COVID to just go away so things can be back to normal. There's nothing wrong with these things in and out of themselves. All of these things reveal to us our dependency and need for something else in life, our need for fulfillment, and it speaks to our fickle sense of contentment. Far too often, we're too consumed by waiting and hoping in these types of things, situations, experiences, and outcomes to be realized, the things that we see, feel, and touch. We set our hearts on them. We build idols and monuments in our hearts while we wait. We're tempted to place our hope in them and on them. We even place our trust in them. We may even feel as if we're in the depths as we wait and hope for expectations and desires to be fulfilled. We become discontent. And when our earthly expectations and desires and outcomes are not fulfilled, we may be tempted to be sinfully fearful and anxious. How, how can we ensure that we're putting things in their proper place at the throne room of our hearts? We need to reorient our hearts waiting and hoping to be focused on something better. Let's look to what the Bible says of how we are to wait. In Luke 12, 35 through 36, Jesus said to his disciples, Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. In Paul's writing to Titus, Titus 2, 11 through 14, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 9, verse 28, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. 2 Peter 3, 13, But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We wait for the master. We wait for our blessed hope. We wait eagerly for him. We wait to dwell with the righteous one, Jesus Christ. We've looked at a few examples of the wait. What, the, what, what does the Bible say about how we should hope? Psalm 33, verse 18 Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. Romans 8, 24 and 25. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We hope in his steadfast love. We hope in what we do not see. We hope in our faith in Jesus Christ. So what have we been waiting on and hoping for that we've allowed to take a hold of our hearts? Consider the psalmist's words in our text, verses five and six. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. Are we waiting for the Lord with our souls? Or are we waiting in an intellectual way, acknowledging it with our minds, but not with our hearts? We can often acknowledge the truth, but not live in light of it. 
our souls, our innermost being, believer, should passionately be waiting for the Lord, hoping in his word, more than watchmen for the morning. The psalmist poetically repeats with emphasis, more than watchmen for the morning. His use of more than watchmen rather than as the watchman should give us pause to recognize the great hope, anticipation, and trust that the psalmist has for the Lord. Are we waiting on the Lord in this way? More than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. Watchmen stand guard at night to guard and protect against intruders and unwelcome people that seek to disrupt and cause harm. And they're awaiting the first glimpse of the sun, the rising sun, the the new day. In the night, in our night, it's inevitable that intruders will come. We will experience difficulty and trials. We'll be tempted, we'll fail, we'll fear, we'll be anxious. These trials wage war on our minds and on our souls. We will sin. But Christian, do we turn to God in our difficulties and trials? Do we trust in him when we experience anxiety and fear? Or do we look to ourselves and man's knowledge, wisdom, ingenuity to help soothe our fears, our anxiety, our troubles? Do we place our hope in things that are seen? Do we practice the sin of pride and our false hope of self-sufficiency? Does our personal self-focused fear of man take the helm of our Christian walk? Or do we wait? Do we wait in the night, waiting on the Lord and hoping in his word more than watchmen for the morning? The psalmist speaks of waiting, his soul waiting on the Lord, and of his hope in the word of the Lord. What have we been waiting on and hoping in during our watch in the night? As we crawl into our beds at the end of the day, we look forward to the new day. And when the sun rises, it it brings joy. Through creation, we catch a glimpse of an eternal new day, a day when the night, the groaning, the difficulty, the trials, and the sinful fallen world that we're living in will be finished when Christ returns. This is our hope. This is what we wait for. Christ, our hope in life and death. We look forward to that morning. In verses one through six, we looked at how the psalmist understands the depths of his sin and how the Lord's forgiveness drives him to be in fear, awe, and reverence of the Lord. We've looked at how the psalmist waits on the Lord with his soul, how he places his hope in his word, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. And we've seen how we are personally tethered to the psalmist's cry. We can identify with all of the above. The psalmist has more to say. Let's look at verses seven and eight. This third point being the salvation of the Lord. Seven and eight. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. The psalmist has taken us with him in his journey, starting in the depths, weight, and the guilt of his sin. He's helped us to understand that the judge of all creation divinely and perfectly marks and holds account of mankind's sin and iniquity. The psalmist poses the question, who could stand in light of this? He proclaims that the Lord forgives and should be feared and revered in light of his merciful forgiveness. The psalmist tells us that his soul waits on the Lord and that he places his hope in his word as watchman in the night awaiting morning. The psalmist, in verses 7 and 8, then changes from first-person testimony to a call to action for all of God's people. We're arriving at the height of this prayer of ascent, the height of the psalmist's testimony. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. 
This is a call for us to acknowledge the truth of the gospel and place our hope, our faith in the Lord. The psalmist beautifully ties it together in telling us why we should hope in the Lord. Listen again to the words of 7 and 8. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. The gospel is ringing out through this psalm. Our greatest need to be reconciled to God and made whole from the depths, depravity, and darkness of sin is realized through God's redemption, redeemed by the birth, death, burial, and resurrection of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. This psalm, Psalm 130, is a wonderful example and framework of the believer's personal testimony of coming to faith in Christ. And for those of us here that believe, rejoice, hope in the Lord, for with him there is steadfast love and plentiful redemption, and he will redeem us from all our iniquity. Amen. Amen. To the unbeliever here today, do you not look around and see the night that we live in, the conspiracy that man focuses on from all sides? the fear and anxiety peddled from all angles of worldly influence? Do you not see that the world is amiss? The corruption that stems from the hearts of sinful men, men striving and toiling to solve mankind's problems apart from the acknowledgement of the truths that the Bible has informed all of us of today. The good news is this. God sent his son Jesus to save us from our sin, to save men from the depths and weight and guilt of sin, your personal sin and iniquity. In him, in his word, there is true hope, a hope that transcends what is seen and resides by the power of the Holy Spirit inside the believer. Might you consider the things you've heard today and place your hope in his word? Do you not see the common lot that all men share of being sinful and needing redemption? Cry out to God and ask him to open your eyes, ears, and your heart to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, you will find what mankind truly needs that can't be found in anything else. We were created for worship, and you must see that worshiping the creation brings no lasting satisfaction. Believers, we must remember that we have been saved from the depths, from our sin and our iniquity. We must remember to fear and revere the Lord who forgives, to wait on the Lord and place our hope in his word alone. We must remember the Lord's steadfast love and plentiful redemption found in our Lord Jesus Christ. God has given us his mercy and grace in and through his son Jesus. And because of the son's perfect sacrifice, we're no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer bound to our sinful flesh. We're new creatures, children of God, adopted sons and daughters of God, the bride of Christ, the church. We have the privilege and honor to turn to God in our own nights through Jesus. So how, how do we live in light of the truths of Psalm 130? We wait on the Lord. We hope in his word. Don't forget about the depths of our sin. Believe in his forgiveness. Believe in his redemption. And while we live in and experience various seasons of night, here now as we live in this fallen world, believe and know that morning has come already spiritually for believers. And we await for the sun to arise, to come back, to return, and bring a new morning of the restored creation. And we wait and hope for the eternity when the dwelling place of God will be with man. I'll close with this psalm. Psalm 30, verses 4 and 5. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Let's pray. Father, help us to wait on you with our innermost being, our souls. Help us to place our hope in your word. 
You've saved us from the biggest threat, an eternal problem, our sin. And in you, we are not to fear the night. Help us to humbly fear you, the one who marks our iniquity and yet provides forgiveness and hope through your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, through your Son and by the Holy Spirit to live lives in this present night that strive to tear down idols of our hearts. We can't do this on our own. We're powerless apart from you, but we find refuge, strength, and perseverance in Jesus Christ. We look forward as watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning, for your return. Amen.